diagonalization and coque reductions are two useful techniques to show that a computational problem is not solvable or that a language is not decidable. We will now discuss a third way of showing that a language is not decidable. And this is called Rice theorem. Before we can state this theorem, we need to establish some extra notation. For every input x, a Turing machine either produces some output y or it does not terminate, it does not halt. And so therefore, if we want to describe what a Turing machine does for each input, we would have to have a function f that maps finite length bit strings, which are the inputs, to either an output or an indication that on that particular input the machine does not halt. And we indicate this here using the bottom symbol. So either we get an output, which is a bit string, or we don't terminate, which is equal to this bottom symbol. So we can describe each Turing machine by a function like this, just indicating for each input what the output is or possibly that the machine does not terminate on that input and therefore doesn't produce any output. The reverse is not necessarily true. So there are some functions like this that do not correspond to a Turing machine. Every Turing machine corresponds to a function of this form, but not every function of this form corresponds to a Turing machine. This is, again, based on a simple counting argument. The set of all Turing machines is countable, but the set of all of these functions is not. Uh, so that's an uncountable set, and therefore clearly there are more of these functions than there are Turing machines, and therefore there must be some functions which don't correspond to a Turing machine. But we are interested in the set of functions that do correspond to Turing machines, and so we call this set R. So R is a set of all of these functions that do correspond to a Turing machine. We are now ready to state Rice theorem. Rice theorem says the following. If C is a non-empty proper subset of R, then the question whether a given Turing machine corresponds to some function f in the subset C is undecidable. In other words, if we have the language LC, which is equal to all alpha, such that M alpha corresponds to some function f in the set C, this language is undecidable. Before we get to the proof, let's briefly discuss what this theorem really says. It's a very powerful theorem because it tells us that a lot of languages are not decidable. Roughly speaking, any language that deals with the question of whether a given Turing machine computes a certain language or solves a certain problem or anything of that nature is not decidable. Again, this is of course very disappointing because we would love to have some procedure in a compiler or so that can automatically check whether a program we produced actually decides the correct language or actually solves the correct problem, actually always has the correct output for uh, each input. So we could automatically check whether programs do the right thing. But Rice theorem tells us that this is not possible. It's important to know that Rice theorem does not say anything about other properties of Turing machines that have nothing to do with their output behavior. So for example, if you ask whether a Turing machine runs for 10 steps and then stops on a particular input, that is decidable. This is not captured by Rice theorem because it talks about the behavior of a Turing machine that has nothing to do with the output behavior of the machine. Now let's prove Rice theorem. Let u be a function that maps every input 
to the bottom symbol. So u of x is the bottom symbol for all values of x. Assume for contradiction that the language consisting of all alpha such that m alpha corresponds to function f in c is decidable. Then we could also construct a Turing machine that computes the function halt. So this once again is a form of a Cook reduction which then will give us a contradiction in the end. So how do we write an algorithm that decides the halting problem given a sub-procedure that we can use for this language LC? It depends. There are two cases. For the first case, let us assume that the function u is not part of the set C. And fix any function f prime that is in C and let m f prime be a Turing machine that corresponds to that function f prime. Remember C is a subset of the set R and all functions in R have a Turing machine that correspond to them. Then we can write the following algorithm for the halting problem. The first step is, given this input alpha and x, we construct a Turing machine m that behaves as follows. On an input y, it first simulates m alpha of x. Here alpha and x are hard-coded into the Turing machine m. Then the machine discards the output from that computation and then simply simulates m f prime of y. Again here f prime is hard-coded into the machine m. And then we just output the result of this second simulation. So what happens if m alpha halts on input x? In that case, the first step of this machine m would terminate and the machine would continue with the second step, the simulation of m f prime on y. And therefore, in that case, the output behavior of the machine would be exactly as of the machine m f prime. So this machine would correspond to the function f prime. On the other hand, if m alpha does not terminate on input x, then what does this machine m do? Well, the first step would be to simulate m alpha on x, but we know that doesn't terminate, so this machine m would run forever. It would never terminate on any input. And because of that, this machine would correspond to the function u. Remember, the function u maps every input to the bottom symbol, so it indicates that on every input the machine does not terminate. So the machine really corresponds to this function u. And u is not in the set c, but f prime is. So if we can decide whether this machine m corresponds to a function in c, then we could find out whether the machine corresponds to the function u or the function f prime. And that would tell us whether m alpha halts on x or not. If the machine does correspond to function f prime, then m alpha does terminate on input x. But if the machine corresponds to function u, we know that m alpha does not terminate on input x. So this would tell us whether m alpha halts on x or not and therefore solve the halting problem. The second and last case we need to handle is one where u is contained in the subset c. This works in an analogous way to the previous case. We just need to sort of switch around some things. So in this case we fix any function f prime that is not contained in the set C. And let m f prime be a Turing machine that corresponds to this function f prime. In this case, we can also compute the halting problem as follows. 
we first construct a Turing machine M that, given the input Y, simulates M alpha on input X, discards the output, and then simulates M f prime of Y and outputs the result of the second simulation. Again, we only construct this machine M. We don't uh, intend to actually execute it. Instead, what we do is we feed this machine to the oracle and ask the oracle whether this machine is in the language LC or not. If it is in the language, then we return 0. And if it is not in the language, we return 1. And similar to the previous case, it's fairly easy to verify that this always gives the correct result. So also in this case, we can decide the halting problem. And this finishes the proof of Rice theorem. Before we move on, let me briefly give some additional comments on Rice theorem, in particular the conditions that are mentioned in Rice theorem. Rice theorem states that the set C needs to be a non empty proper subset of R. Why did I include these terms non empty and proper? In particular, where in the proof did we use these two properties? Can you find where this is used in the proof? Indeed, we used that the set C is non-empty when in the first case we wanted to fix a function f prime that is contained in C. And we used the fact that the set is proper when we were in case 2 where we wanted a function f prime that is not in C. And this is really necessary. If we remove one of those conditions, the theorem becomes false. Suppose C is an empty subset of R, so C does not include any function. Then the language LC becomes trivial. This is because in that case we are asking whether a given Turing machine corresponds to some function in an empty set. But of course the answer to this would always be no, because the set is empty, so there are no functions in that set, so the Turing machine cannot correspond to any function in the set. On the other hand, suppose C is the entire set R, so it's not a proper subset of R. In that case, the language LC is also trivial. Because what we are asking now is whether a given Turing machine corresponds to a function in the set R. But every Turing machine corresponds to a function in the set R. That's sort of how R was defined. So in that case, when C is equal to R, the correct answer for this language LC is always yes. So in both cases we can easily decide the language. In the first case we can construct a Turing machine that ignores the input and always just says no. And in the second case we can construct a Turing machine that always ignores the input and just says yes. So both of those conditions are really important for Rice theorem.